to begin with, I've actually done this at short notice because Richard Wilkie was going to be talking. Um, and I thought I'd just explore surgery generically, you know, um, not just colorectal surgery, but why, why surgery? Why do you want to be a surgeon? Um, job satisfaction? If you talk to most surgeon, most surgeons, actually the best bit of our job is all of it. The day job, doing, hands-on. It's a very rewarding job. If you talk to us again about the worst bits, admin and paperwork. Um, but, but most of us start off as, as very practically orientated people. You see a problem, you're looking for a solution. Um, so it's rewarding clinically, emotionally, financially, maybe, maybe not, we'll come on to that. Kudos. I guess to the public, it is quite a, a you know, a sensitive thing. You're a surgeon, it's uh, sexy. Yeah? <laughs> Don't go into it for that. What about the difficulties? I mean, it's not all you know, brilliant. Um, it's hard work. And I think most of you now you're doing clinicals will have recognized the fundamental difference is that most surgical firms start before eight to do all the admin and paperwork before the ward round. You'll then do a, a business ward round between eight and nine and then go to your day to day commitment, whether that be theater, clinic, endoscopy, whatever. So it's actually a longer day in surgery. And if you go abroad, state, knife to skin at seven o'clock, which means you're on the ward at six. Yeah, so it is a longer day, it's arduous. Um, the training is necessary longer. Um, it's a very practical subject. Now, if you want to be a physician, um, a lot of it is factual knowledge. When a medical registrar calls his boss at 2 a.m. to say, I've got this patient, da -da 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 -da, what do you suggest? It really is, what do you advise, given that I've given you all those clinical parameters? When one of my team calls me at 2am and says, Mr Williams, I've got this case and I need your help physically because it's a difficult operation. Yeah? Dif big difference. Yeah? So it, it's arduous in terms of your commitment, your time. And necessarily it does impact on your life outside of medicine. If you're a concert grade pianist, you probably won't be a concert grade pianist and a surgeon at the same time. If you're an elite athlete, Actually, surgery will eat into that. And you have to be very realistic about your goals and ambitions. Because if you want to continue that and do surgery, you're going to have to be you know, an Olympian to do both. It does need to eat into family time. And we, we we're from a different generation. Um, I trained in the early 80s. I graduated mid 80s. And at the time, actually, most surgeons were men. Why? Because you could only do it because your spouse would support your life by doing everything else for you. So you could then focus on surgery. Actually, it's a bit more balanced now. Um, a, because it's not quite as all-encompassing. But B, it's, it's far fairer in that there are men who will support their wives to go through surgical training. Um, so I, I think that's being redressed. It's high-risk stuff. People die, and they die on that admission. You know, someone you've seen, you've talked to, you've consented for an operation, you've worked them through, and they have the audacity to die on you. It's terrible. No, so it is, it's a stressful thing. And those who feel that it won't affect you, it will. It will. And it's hard. And you've got to be open with yourself about that. It's stressful. I won't dwell too much on this because you, you'll, it's all accessible. But in general principle, after medical school, you have a two-year foundation program, um, core surgical training, and then higher surgical training. Um, plan ahead, very much as Ms. Markham said, plan ahead, tick all the boxes, make yourself sellable. Yeah? Um, and that, th those key areas are the jump from foundation to core training, and then from core training to higher surgical training. The advice from higher surgical training to consultant is about choosing your specialty, not colorectal or vascular. Or Choose what you want to specialize in as a consultant. Find out where they do it best and go there. Go to Mecca. 
find out where they do it best. But plan ahead. Places like Toronto, places like the Mayo, places like Singapore are working three to five years in advance. So plan ahead. <laughs> I fell foul of that because um, when I did my MD in Manchester in the 90s, my boss was then Nigel Scott, who later was president of the Association of Coloproctology. And he'd spent his time at the Mayo. Um, and through that lineage, I did all my paperwork and was allocated a slot at the Mayo Clinic for 1999 from a 94 application, by which time I'd already taken up the consultant and so lost it by not planning ahead. Obstacles, exams, right. Finals, once they're over, that's the beginning, I'm afraid. The next big hurdle will be the MRCS. Um, the MRCS is in two parts. All the information is on the college website. Um, but part A is essentially a test of factual knowledge. Um, it's an MCQ base. Again, if you look back, um, there are some lovely treats out there. Um, there's one little book called The Making of a Surgeon, which did the rounds in the 70s and 80s. And it was written by Professor Sir Ian Aird. It also used to be called Aird's Little Red Book. It's only about that big, fits in your pocket, and only about 50 to 70 pages. But it was full of little one-liners like the knife before the wife. Yeah, that's life. And it talks about the old exam, the primary FRCS, which we all took, had a pass rate of about 15%. Yeah, it was in three parts. And many of us passed two out of three on one occasion, two out of three on another occasion. So, so, but it was a difficult exam. It was based on anatomy, physiology, and pathology. And Ed's comment was, the FRC, the primary is a difficult exam. And although the factual knowledge that you learn for the primary may not be necessary for your professional career, the discipline involved in learning that knowledge will stand you in good stead for the rest of your life. Yeah? And there are those of your colleagues who will listen to that. Yeah? And, but if that rings a bell with you about hard work and discipline and being motivated and driven, you're in the right place. Yeah? So Ed's Little Red Book is, I've seen a copy on eBay, on Amazon Prime now for 60 odd quid. It's just silly. It's out of print, but it's, you, there are some snippets around if you Google it. Entry exit to training, we've briefly mentioned, it's about making yourself sellable. Endurance, um, you have to stick at it. You have to stick at it. And when you saw that grid, you're looking at 10 years ahead of you, really. Yeah, 10 years. It takes endurance and staying power. Um, I've put those last two really more as food for thought, extent versus um, uh, experience versus training. I can train one of my registrars to do an operation in, let's say, 10 procedures. Okay? So he's trained. However, if it goes wrong, how does he rescue it? He rescues it from experience. Experience is what you get when you do something you think, I wish I hadn't done that, now I need to do something to put it right, you see. So in your careers, there will be that dilemma of training versus experience. You will be trained, but your level of experience, and you take a, take a consultant place, may be slightly different to a different generation. And so at the moment, what we have is a process of mentoring. So in your first year or two or three, yeah, phone your friend, oh, I can give you a hand. And that's really important, just be self-aware. Yeah? You are trained, but experience comes from making mistakes and thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Putting it right. Oh, sorry, let's move on. Um, food for thought. Um, surgery. Surgery is a very practical subject. Um, and in the 90s, the college, the Royal College of Surgeons, played with this idea of psycho psychomotor testing. Hand eye coordination. Um, it works really well with airline pilots because their simulators are very good. Yeah? We don't have the same high caliber simulators for surgery, but we do have uh, bench appliances, various models which we can do. And so there isn't a psychomotor test as such. 
okay? But when you do basic surgical skills, of course you're observed. Now, ability is a normal distribution curve. And necessarily, someone will be here and someone will be here, yeah? And so you have to work out where you are. Now, to be a surgeon, do you have to be in the top half, middle half, bottom half? There's no, there's no clear-cut um, cut-off point. Um, personality. We've talked about being driven and being motivated. An interesting fact. Um, I don't know if you come across Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs is a personality uh, indicator. It just gives you an idea of what's going on under the bonnet. Now, it categorizes how you deal with information um, according to four traits. And the observation is that there is a one subgroup of the population called ISTJ, which occupies about 12, 14% of the population, but accounts for 85% of all airline pilots. Chicken or egg, work it out. I mean, do you go to be a pilot because your mindset puts you down that way, or do you have the aptitude because your mindset allows you to deal with information? Yeah? By contrast, most surgeons, not all, most are ESTJs or ISTJs. Um, so very similar in your thought patterns. Comes to the next thing. You've heard the comment, he's a born surgeon. Um, no such thing. It takes time and training and working at it. Male, female bias. The world's moved on. Um, when I was an STJ, there was one female trainee amongst 30 surgical trainees. It's far more even now, and access is just as equal. Um, so colorectal surgery, what do I do? Well, half my work is cancer of the bowel or the rectum. Um, the other half is inflammatory bowel disease, um, which is colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, so with that, you either take bits out and for my subspecialist work is uh, reconstructive surgery. So, unfortunately, quite a lot of young people get inflammatory bowel disease and you take the program and they get an agnostic. Not many people want an agnostic. It has a major impact on your quality of life, subjective and objective. And so, we can do some reconstructive surgery, use the other thing, plug it on the inside, internal patch. It's all plugging, but there you go. Um, so, that's what I do for my complex work. Um, the day case stuff, bums and bums and bums and bums. I mean, we'll go back to the northern comet where there's muck, there's brass. Okay, so it pays the bills. Um, there's also functional bowel work. Uh, we do inpatient and day case operating, outpatient and endoscopies. Now, a working week for a surgeon would be essentially a day's operating list, inpatient work, complex work, um, day cases, bums, hern uh, hernias fistulas, fissures, hemorrhoids, uh, endoscopy, which is a camera test usually on the, on the colon, um, clinic, new patients, follow-ups, multidisciplinary meeting where you discuss all cancer patients, um, supporting professional activity, all the other admin, etc., and on call. So the average working week is allegedly um, 40 hours, but quite often it's about 50 when you do on calls and admin and stuff. So that's it in a nutshell, really. As I said, it was just a snapshot, food for thought. Um, secret of colorectal surgery. <laughs> 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 <And> educated for <laughs> me. We'll do questions afterwards, if that's okay. Yeah?